Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Here when you need us most, now and always. RWJ Barnabas Health. Operating Engineers, Local 825. IBEW Local 102. Lighting the path, leading the way. Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters. The New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Wells Fargo. The New Jersey Education Association. And by Suez North America. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Welcome to a very special edition of State of Affairs here on News 12 Plus. I'm Steve Adubato, and more importantly, Kevin O'Toole, Chairman, Board of Commissioners, Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Uh, Kevin, real quick, as we introduce this uh, program in which you are on as well as others, at the Port Authority, what would you say in 2022 the most important, the top priority in terms of in infrastructure rebuilding is? Uh, well, first of all, it's keeping the agency, the 100-year agency, moving forward. We have a capital plan of $37 billion with 8,000 employees on the ground working. We're rebuilding Newark, rebuilding LaGuardia, rebuilding uh, Kennedy. Uh, and by the end of this year, you're going to see a three airports, the largest in the country, are going to be essentially re rebuilt from the ground on up. Uh, and more, uh, equally important, we want to make sure that we're going to go back to those numbers that we had record-breaking numbers in 2019. Given COVID's uh, problem, obviously for two years, we've lost over $3 billion in revenue. And we're hoping by the end of this year to get back fully and beat beyond the uh, revenue expectations and projections of 2019. That's Kevin O'Toole. This is a special edition of State of Affairs right here on News 12+. Plus. Port Authority is an incredibly important agency um, impacting our region, New York and New Jersey. Uh, this is State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. More importantly, that is the chairman, Kevin O'Toole. This is State of Affairs. Check it out. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. I want to kick this program off with um, a gentleman who most people recognize if they watch our program and a whole range of other public broadcasting programs. Kevin O'Toole is the chairman of the Board of Commissioners of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, a former state senator in the state, the head of uh, a co the co-head, excuse me, of O'Toole Scrivo, a law firm in our state, and also a columnist with NJ Globe. Good to see you, Kevin. Good to see you, Steve. How are you? I'm doing great. Listen, I was reading NJ Globe, and you actually wrote a column called Two Years is a Lifetime. We're taping this in mid-March. It'll be seen later. You talked about leadership at the Port Authority and in other places, but the biggest leadership lesson you and your colleagues at the Port Authority learned over these past two-plus years has been? Uh, well, first of all, when a crisis comes upon you, real leaders got to act. Like, so two years ago, almost to the day, you know, I get news that our senior staff had all had to be quarantined because they all had been uh, exposed to uh, the, the, the virus. And all of a sudden, the Port Authority with 8,000 employees was going to lockdown. And so you've got to kind of like act quickly and you've got to surround yourself with really smart people. And there's no playbook for it, Steve. You got to say you got to keep the agency moving forward with the highways and the roadways and the ports. Um, and you got to make sure your employees feel safe and they are safe and their, and their families feel safe as well. So you've got to kind of react and you can't show them that you're nervous or you're worried. You know, I, I got to follow up on that because you've also joined us on our sister program, uh, lessons in leadership. So we've talked leadership before, but what struck me about this column is that you said leaders must be fearless. You kept talking about being fearless. And I've got this thing where you, um, my father, my late father, who you were very close to, um, and I was at times, but let me just put this out there. My father used to say, the best leaders, it's not that they're not afraid, it's that they are afraid, but in spite of being afraid, they act anyway. They do what's courageous anyway, but it's not that they're not afraid. Help me on this fearless thing, Kevin. 
So, I mean, it's perspective. So I have a mother who came from North Korea when she was 13 and she lost some of her siblings on the way. And she saw some of the real death in front of her when she mar marched from Wonsan to Seoul. Um, and she was kind of fearless and she saw the very worst. You see people who are suffering, whether it's they get a brain tumor, whether they lose their jobs, whether they have a sick child, like those are things to be fearful of. But even in those moments, you've got to seize the moment and you have to lean. It just comes upon you because you just can't wring your hands and say, oh, you know, poor me. That doesn't get you anywhere. And when you lead, when you're given the privilege to lead an organization, they don't want to see people who are afraid. Even in your inner self, as your dad would say, you even though you have some of those doubts, You've got to project strength and resiliency and determination and support and gratitude and move the organization forward. And because if For you those, don't, they right. will they, they will suffer. You know, again, by the way, check out uh, NJ Globe, one of our media partners, uh, to find uh, previous columns from Senator O'Toole. But I want to ask you this, Kevin, you've been out of government official uh, elected office for how many years? Since 17. So I'm working on five years. OK. The kind of leadership you just described, fearless, courageous, doing what's right so that others who are following you or need to follow you <clears throat> have courage themselves. To what degree do you see that in government today, both parties across the board? How rare is it? Rare. It, um, it, it's not encouraged, you know, when you're in the elected arena, when you're in the Senate or the Assembly, you're worrying about the next election. I mean, people in the redistricting just went by. They're terrified. I mean, grown yeah, men talk about redistricting. Are... Explain to folks 30 seconds or less. They're sure. like, what? There's a redistricting every commission? What does that mean? A, every 10 years after a census, there's a redistricting, and you've got to cut the state into 40 equal districts, 235,000 per. So what happens is the legislative districts get re rejiggered a little bit, and some people lose their, their safe districts, become competitive, and people worry about their livelihoods. And when they do that, Steve, well, you were, all some of these folks are born and bred to do is worry about their next elections. And that doesn't breed a leader. That doesn't breed fearlessness. Uh, that breeds people who just worry about a calculated decision to move on to their next election. How does that impact those of us who are constituents of those elected officials? Well, listen, I, I think it, it impacts us because I think there's a the day of 30 years ago when you had true leaders and your dad was one of them, Joe Doria, people that would out, go out there and make these broad Former Assembly policies. Speaker Joe Doria. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Right. It'd make these broad policies working together with Republicans and Democrats. And one of the things I wrote about recently, Steve, is they don't encourage that. There's no arena. There's no schooling. There's no college. There's no framework that says, hey, leaders on both sides, let's have a framework that we can have a discussion. D.C. is not leading, and Trenton's not leading. You see, all you're worrying about is the cheap political hits, and you move on. And listen, in my earlier day, I would do some of that. As I grew uh, less afraid about losing an election, I said, I have to be the big thinker and work with crossover with the Brian Stacks and the Steve Sweeney's and the Nick Scataris or the Joe Lagana's, uh, Vin Gopal, the Democrats who are in the leadership positions. You have to work with them. And I've encouraged a lot of the Republicans, don't just be a bomb thrower and say no on every Everything. Work together on infrastructure, education, you know, educational lag, which we're talking about, environmental issues that we can get behind, labor issues we can get behind. But I think they're so conditioned to just go in this narrow field that plays to the next election, primary or general, and people are afraid and they just don't grow the leaders of yesterday. And I'm sorry I'm saying that. Well, no, it's okay. And, and, and Senator O'Toole, who has been out of government for five years, uh, understands it from a perspective of running for office every two years. I, I have disclosed this before that I served in the legislature for a very short period of time in the 80s. And I can appreciate, uh, Kevin, we didn't have to remind people that it was two years. All right. Was that, was that a peace sign? That was a peace years? sign, Steve, but you said two years. OK, yeah, it was two years. But it, in that short period of time, I know exactly what he's talking about. You, you, you think you're going to do the right thing. You're there to be courageous, to be fearless. And then you're like, wait a minute. But if I lose this election, I'm not here anymore. Real quick on that. But Steve, how terrified were you when you were losing? Seriously, when you lost, you were broken and you were afraid. You oh, thanks, Kevin. To win. But listen, <laughs> you've become this you know, Emmy winner. You've been a, you, it was the best thing that ever happened to you was losing that election. Not at the time. I didn't think it at the time. Of course not at the time. But now when you look back, it was the best experience. And from that born, from that experience, you have you've, uh, this leadership, you know, uh, trait that was, you know, cast upon you, largely shoved down your throat by your father. But, uh, you're, but I want to, again, not about me, but there's a larger issue here. Do you believe that our elected officials in Congress, in the state legislature, across the board, governors, whomever, who have to run again, 
or have the ability to run again if they're not term limited, that their fear of losing is so great that their sense, and this sounds like a deep psychological question as well, that if you're not in elected office, you don't matter. And that's yeah, just not yes. true. Yeah. So if this elected office defines many of these people, when they go on to their, like, you see senators, they're easy, they're, as opposed to retiring willingly like I did and Bill Gorman and others do, they'll die in office because that identifies them. They don't want to leave the office. They'd rather be in a body bag than literally retire willingly because they want to be known as the senator because people get their, they call them back, they get respected, they get all the service, the great tables. Um, the reality is if you are lucky enough to be an elected official, take advantage of that very small period of time you, you are elected and make bold decisions, do things that are amazing. And because I'm telling you, if you don't take that opportunity, you will be regretful down the road. And I talked to a lot of legislators who are retired, forced and voluntary, and they regret not taking advantage of the time they were in office. As you listen to Kevin O'Toole, a couple of things. Um, I believe in post-production will put our democracy at a crossroads. We haven't used the word democracy at a crossroads or that phrase, but everything that Kevin O'Toole has been talking about is exactly about democracy being at a crossroads or beyond that, something worse. And also, let me say that uh, O'Toole Scrivo is one of the law firms that support what we do. Um, Kevin, I want to thank you for joining us. We appreciate your perspective. Thanks, thanks Check out it. NJ Globe uh, for Kevin O'Toole's columns and a whole range of other things. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Steve. Good talking to you. You guys, stay with us. We'll be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. I'm Tim Sullivan, CEO of the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Since joining the NJEDA, I've been struck by the incredible assets and resources that New Jersey has to offer. The NJEDA is working every day to grow New Jersey's economy in a way that maximizes the values of those assets to benefit every single New Jersey resident. This includes more support for small businesses and a focus on reclaiming New Jersey's position as a leader in the innovation economy. Visit NJEDA.com to learn more about how NJEDA is building a stronger and fairer New Jersey economy. We're now joined by John Farmer, Jr., director of the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University. My alma mater, not only Rutgers, but Eagleton. <clears throat> it's very hard to get into. I still have no idea how I got in, John, but that's another story. <laughs> One of our most prominent alums. So uh, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Hey, let's do this. Let's talk about really important things. Um, we're taping in the middle of March. It'll be seen later. I've said this to you before. The graphic will come up, democracy at a crossroads. We talked about six months ago, John. <clears throat> is our system of democracy at greater risk than it was six months ago? And if so, why? Well, I think our, our system writ large is. I mean, so we've had, obviously, the internal threats to democracy that we've talked about before um, that culminated in the, in the riot at the Capitol on January 6th. Um, and now we see what really what the real threat to democracy is. Ultimately, it's it's the use of brutal force, which we're now seeing in the Ukraine. Uh, so there are, uh, democracy is struggling on many fronts, uh, both domestically and internationally. And I think um, uh, we are at a crossroads. John, again, because we're taping, <clears throat> excuse me, in the middle of March, we hope and pray um, for the people of Ukraine. But we do not know what's going to happen. And we're not doing war coverage. But there is a larger question. You connect the fight for democracy and the movement of, the, of, of Vladimir Putin and Russia, a non-small-D democratic government, with our crisis to democracy. Why is that? Well, because he illustrates what lies at the end of a failed uh, attempt uh, to govern democratically. We, you know... Through history, democracies have been very fragile, and they've ultimately ended in totalitarian forms of government. And that's what we have to be conscious of uh, constantly. And I think something we've lost sight of over the years, we've taken for granted that our system would just work uh, on its own without our attending to it. And so we could be free to have our, our, our violent disagreements, and somehow everything would be fine. 
I think what, what we see in the world now, and it's, it's really culminating in, right now in the Ukraine, but, but this movement toward authoritarian governments has been, under, uh, has been going on now for, uh, for decades. And you know, we have Russia, we have China, we have Hungary, we have even the government of Poland has sort of started tilting toward authoritarianism. And I think part of that is a reaction to, um, to the sort of the excesses maybe of, um, of, of freedom of expression that, that the social media has brought about. Uh, but we've really lost sight of the fact that we have to pay attention to the need to, to engage with each other and to compromise. Um, and it's exasperating to compromise, but it's the essence of our system. Our system is set up so that if we don't compromise, it won't work. Uh, and so that's, that's why I, I connect the two, because, because Putin is the logical endpoint of a failed experiment in democracy. So, John, you're the former attorney general in the state. You believe in and have lived by the rule of law for many, many years. There are a significant number of Americans uh, who don't agree with what you're saying in this sense. They argue that, A, we make too much, particularly those of us in the media, academia, we make too much of January 6th. And it has absolutely nothing to do with what you're talking about, A and B. It was a protest. And uh, former President Trump has said really positive things about those who not just protested, but in fact rioted that day and assaulted the United States uh, Capitol and put members of Congress uh, at risk. And finally, not my opinion, many of them argued for uh, Vice President at the time, Mike Pence, uh, for horrible things that happened to him. Yeah. Am I overstating this? Am I engaging in hyperbole, John Farmer? No, I don't think so. Um, I think anybody who, who tried to minimize um, the, the shock of what happened on January 6th um, either doesn't understand how our country is supposed to work uh, or has uh, other motivations that are, that are nefarious to, <laughs> to our future. Um, Hold on, John. Anybody... A devil's advocate, devil's advocate. They were just, they wanted to stop what they believe to be a fraudulent election, which the former president continues to state was a fraudulent election. 70 to 80 percent of the Republicans in this nation who are polled say the president, Joe Biden, is not really the president. Yeah, well, that's, the, they're just protesting been, what they thought was a stolen election. That's been a trending in our in our politics now for a couple of decades. You know, the challenge to the legitimacy of whoever's the president. Um, you know, both parties have engaged in it, and, and it's got to stop because it's, you know, the, the, the theory that somehow that election was stolen has been tested in do literally dozens of court cases on which I've been involved in, and nowhere, nowhere has it been established. At some point, you have to come to grips with reality, and the reality is that the election wasn't stolen, that Joe Biden is our president, and, you know, what to say to people who disagree, they're not looking at the facts. Yeah, but... but when I say devil's advocate, what I really mean is what do we say to those who say, I don't care what you say, John Farmer. I don't care that you're attorney general or that you're the head of the Eagleton Institute. I don't buy it. I believe it was stolen. So if people believe that and if former President Trump, and it's not about President Trump, but he's the one saying this and he has a lot of people following him. If people continue to believe in both parties, but disproportionately Republicans right now, that elections are not legitimate, what does that mean for our democracy? It means we have a long way to go to sort of recover um, our civic values. Uh, we have been at, we've reached a point now where people, uh, because of the way that they're, they're getting their news and, and the way that social media works, you know, where you have basically the commercial algorithms that drive it, that, that tend to drive polarization by basically reinforcing whatever proclivities people express. Uh, we're, now in a, we're now at a place where uh, you can have that kind of sort of almost pre-Civil War atmosphere where you can't talk to the other person. Pre-Civil War? In other words, in the, you know, prior to the Civil War, you had basically, it reached a point where uh, the people in the North couldn't even talk to the people in the South. The narratives were so different. It's something that I, that I studied extensively in law school. And, and it's remarkable how we've almost replicated that um, today, where people can't even can't even reach common ground about what, what the facts are, uh, so I think the, the process of recovering our civic values has to start with look, taking a, a really hard look 
at the at the media environment in which we live, in which there are very few, uh, very few outlets, you know, like frankly um, PBS, uh, that do that do strive to be down the middle and to present both sides of things and to and to force both sides to be in the same conversation. Uh, so what happens now is all you're hearing about are the thing are the people we're hearing from the people you agree with. When you encounter someone who doesn't agree with you, you almost have nothing to say to them. Um, and that's, I think, what you're driving at with, with your devil's advocate point. Like, what, where do you start to that conversation? Uh, if, they're, if they choose to believe that the election was stolen, how do you persuade them otherwise? Very but difficult John, I'm going to push this even further. Uh, I know there's a time issue, but I, I want to push this further. If people believe certain things, but they, then they go to news sources, information sources, uh, social media sites, uh, news organizations, whatever they are, that simply tell them that's right. Well, then what the heck are we supposed to do who have no horse? I, I say this all the time. People say, what do you mean you don't have a horse in the race? The only horse we have in the race is democracy. It's not about D's and R's, conservatives, Republicans. Then what is our job in all this? Well, I think, I think your job, I mean... Um... The job of people who don't have a horse in the race is to try to talk to both sides and try to persuade them um, that these differences they have, you know, can be overcome if, they, if there's a sincere effort to do it. But I think that the, what fundamentally has to happen, I think, Steve, is is we have to take a look at at regulating the public marketplace, the marketplace. What does that ideas. mean, real quick? We've got the First Amendment. What does that mean, John? Freedom of speech, freedom of press. What does well, it mean to regulate the market? Is, you know, it's not absolute. Uh, that's been established in court cases. I think the uh, recent decisions by the Supreme Court equating spending with speech was a mistake. Uh, you know, there, we have other free societies where where uh, speech is regulated. And and you know what what what's clear about our Constitution? It was intended to be a pragmatic document. You know, not some metaphysical treatise that you parse. You know, like a like an astrophysicist or a or a, or a high priest of some kind. You know, the Constitution, as Justice Jackson said, is not a suicide pact. But, the, but the, the sort of absolutist rulings of the Supreme Court on some of these issues have set up a situation where it could become a suicide pact. Um, if they've created a situation where spending is speech and that and, and social media can't be regulated, uh, political spending can't be regulated, dark money prevails, they're creating an atmosphere of total chaos. And I think that needs to be looked at. John Farmer, uh, former Attorney General, Director of the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Thank you, John, as always. Hey, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it, Steve. You got it. I'm Steve Adubato. Stay with us. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. I'm Tim Sullivan, CEO of the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Since joining the NJEDA, I've been struck by the incredible assets and resources that New Jersey has to offer. The NJEDA is working every day to grow New Jersey's economy in a way that maximizes the values of those assets to benefit every single New Jersey resident. This includes more support for small businesses and a focus on reclaiming New Jersey's position as a leader in the innovation economy. Visit NJEDA.com to learn more about how NJEDA is building a stronger and fairer New Jersey economy. We're honored to be joined by Andy Williams, who is executive director of an organization called Community in Crisis. Good to see you, Andy. Good to see you, too. Thanks very much. Andy, back in 2013, two overdose deaths in the space of just a week in Somerset Hills. Um, in New Jersey led to the beginning of this organization, this movement. What is it and what impact are you having? Well, we began as a small group around a kitchen table, um, to all volunteers, and we decided there and then that we needed to do something to prevent any more overdose deaths as best we could. Uh, we've come an awfully long way since then. Uh, we Really, we, we look at ourselves as kind of two pillars of focus, the one side being prevention education, raising awareness about the dangers of substance use. So preventing that path before they even start down it, hopefully. And then the other end, we're like the bookends of substance use disorder. The other end of that would be um, helping people seeking and in recovery 
uh, find sobriety and lead a healthy and fulfilling life. We're putting up the website as we speak right now. Thank um, you. Wh why, from a personal perspective, Andy, obviously you care as a member of the community, someone who cares about the people in your community. Is there a personal connection for you? Well, fortunately, not within my immediate family. I, I would defy anyone to say that they didn't have it, you know, in their larger extended family. Absolutely. Uh, I, Same yeah, here. You know, yes, um, you know, definitely. But I have three children, um, all of whom are now in their 20s. And, you know, it was there, but for the grace of God that helped me sort of really be driven by the passion because you know I realized there and then when I saw which which two kids had actually overdosed during that particular week that you referenced I knew it could have been my kid you know successful seemingly no cares in the world uh just had everything in life to look forward to so that's been my driving force and uh I think that applies to most of our staff here and volunteers too um have we done enough Andy to destigmatize um, the issue of use of uh, drugs, opioids, et cetera. Have we done enough to do that? Well, when you talk about stigma, uh, definitely not. Um, a report came out not that long ago from Shatterproof that actually said that even amongst the medical community, uh, there was high um, high percentage of people who still considered um, individuals suffering with substance use disorder as having made poor choices, um, being weak, and um, you know just just terrible attitudes towards it. When at the end of the day, our message is that substance use disorder is a treatable chronic disease, like diabetes, like cancer. And the more that we spread that message, uh, the more support we will be able to garner and the more individuals will feel that they're being understood and listened to, which doesn't often happen. By the way, you talk about, I ask every not-for-profit leader this question, you have to raise money on a regular basis, right? We do. Foundations, corporations, correct? Yes. Yeah, it, it never ends. Uh, real quick, can I get 30 seconds on harm reduction? What's harm reduction? Well, harm reduction is a little controversial, um, but it's, you know, it's evidence based and it's everything from um, using Narcan, which is an opioid antidote reversal. It's, you know, it's a nasal spray and also an injection to reverse the effects of an opioid overdose. Um, to using fentanyl test strips to check and see if a substance actually contains fentanyl, because as little as two milligrams can potentially uh, cause a fatality. It can be medicated assisted treatment. So it's really about meeting people where they're at. Um, it's, it's understanding with compassion that they have a disease and that they need help. Um, so it, it would be like saying to somebody with cancer, okay, just get well by tomorrow. Take this treatment and get well. It just and doesn't happen that way. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's one thing to talk about recovery, which is incredibly important, but prevention is, is it, you, it's not one without the other. Uh, Andy Williams, who's Executive Director of Community in Crisis, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate the opportunity. Okay, that's Andy. I'm Steve. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, RWJ Barnabas Health, Operating Engineers Local 825, IBEW Local 102, Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, Wells Fargo, the New Jersey Education Association, and by Suez North America. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Globe and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. I'm Tim Sullivan, CEO of the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Since joining the NJEDA, I've been struck by the incredible assets and resources that New Jersey has to offer. 
the NJEDA is working every day to grow New Jersey's economy in a way that maximizes the values of those assets to benefit every single New Jersey resident. This includes more support for small businesses and a focus on reclaiming New Jersey's position as a leader in the innovation economy. Visit NJEDA.com to learn more about how NJEDA is building a stronger and fairer New Jersey economy.